Presenting Orson Welles as the third man. The lives of Harry Lyme. The fabulous stories of the immortal character, originally created in the story The Third Man, with zither music by Anton Karras. Put a man in a Palm Beach suit sling a camera over his shoulder, give him a cigar and an American accent. And anywhere on the continent of Europe, he's marked down at once by the smart boys as a sheep ready for the slaughter. Of course, there are exceptions. I was never a guy to boast. Well, not much, anyway. In a long and not uneventful career, I flatter myself there aren't many tricks of the confidence trade that I haven't got to know. At least that's what I thought. Until a certain adventure befell me recently in Paris which, for obvious reasons, I've called Vive la Chance. And now, Orson Welles as Harry Lyme, the third man, in today's story, Vive la Chance. It happened, as I've said, in Paris, in a casual sort of way. I got to know a couple of the local boys named Paul and Pierre. And one evening, they came up to my hotel room and made me a proposition. The whole scheme is simplicity itself, Mr. Mm. Absolutely. What you call a pullover. You mean a pushover, don't you, old man? Certainly, so that is what I say, a pullover. Okay, skip it. There's this American gentleman, you see. Which American gentleman? This, uh, comment s'appelle-t-il, Pierre? A Wotherspoon. Ah, oui, Henry L. Wotherspoon. That sounds promising. What about Henry L. Wotherspoon? Uh, he is a very rich gentleman. Good for him. He does not know us, but we know him. Good for we you. We have studied him closely. We know his habits, his movements, everything about him. Yeah. Is that not so, Paul? But yes. So we had made a plan, Pierre and I. A very simple plan, as we tell you, but when the tenant fails to succeed. Well, only well. it is no good for just ourselves. It needs Lisette. Lisette? A friend of ours, monsieur. Ah, très bien. Now listen carefully, and we will explain to you the whole thing. Well, as Paul and Pierre explained their scheme to me, I can't say it was exactly simple, but it, it was certainly novel. And what's more, it seemed to be just about foolproof. My first task was to get on friendly terms with this Henry J. Wotherspoon. That was easy. Huh? Next morning, I moved to his hotel. Inside of 24 hours, you'd have thought we were lifelong buddies. He was a middle-aged Californian, typically wealthy, American tourist all by himself, feeling just a little lonely in a big, strange city. Another lonely American must have seemed to him like manna from heaven. It was evening. We were drinking together at a sidewalk cafe. The stage was set for step number two of our plan. Hey. Hey, Henry, look. What's the matter? That girl walking toward us, there's something wrong with her, I'm sure. She looks all right to me. Kind of cute, in fact. Well, if I saw her sway. Henry, I'm positive, but hey, there she goes again. She needs help. Here, Mademoiselle, take it easy. Lean on my arm. Come on now. Who's that my lad, n'est-ce pas? Who's that my lad? I am all right. Well, you're not all right at all. You just passed out a minute ago. Come along. Here. Sit down here with my friend and me. Pull up another chair, Hank. Sure. Poor kid's starving. Oh. We've had a decent meal for days, I'll bet. Uh, vous avez faim, mademoiselle? Oh, no, 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 no. You can't kid us. Uh, what did you eat last? This morning. What did you have? Oh, some bread and... There. Bread. And what else? Some water. Bread and water. <laughs> what did I say? No, 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 no don't cry. Oh, don't cry. 
lips are shaking. No, no, snap out of it. We've all been broke at one time or another. Take her other arm, Henry. Hey, come on now, let's go. Where to? Well, to find the biggest meal in Paris, of course. <laughs> My first meeting with Lizette. She was all Paul and Pierre had said, and more. As she went steadily through the menu, it was an education to watch the color return to her face and to see her whole character take on life and vivacity. And afterwards, we found a quiet corner in a bar, and with a little help from me, Lizette gave us her life history, all according to plan. You sure have had a tough time, Mademoiselle. Oh, I do not complain. One day fortune will smile on me, and then all will be well. Sure it will. In, in, in fact, even now I have hopes that very soon, perhaps even before this week is out, I, I will be a wealthy woman. You'll be a wealthy woman. <laughs> Oh, how's that? Are you figuring on marrying some guy with lots of dough? Dough? Uh, money. Oh, no, no, it is nothing like that. It is quite different, you see. Oh, but Dr. Lenoir, I have already talked too much. I must not bother you with my personal Oh, please, affairs. we're very interested, aren't we, Henry? Sure. Uh, well, you see, 80 years ago, my family was very rich. They lived in a big house, down the Bois, in the woods outside Fontainebleau. Oh, yes. And then yes. came la guerre. The war, yes. Uh, which uh, particular one was that? The Franco-Prussian War, huh? Oh, uh, oui. My great-grandfather was afraid the place would be... Oh, how you call it? Uh, uh, plundered by the Prussians. So mm. Somewhere in the woods, he buried a great box full of gold and louis. Really? And he, he, oui, and he drew a map where it was, and he hid the map in the false bottom of the jewel case. And he wrote to his son, my grandfather, a letter saying what he had done. I see. Then came the Prussians, and he was killed. Your great grandfather's killed, uh, uh, Oui. Yes. My grandfather knew the money must be hidden somewhere, but uh, he could never find that was it. What about the map? Uh, well, that was the trouble, you see. He did not know about the map. Oh. Because he did not have the letter his father had written. Oh, consider the irony. Yes, my oh, For goodness. years, there was the jewel case on his dressing table, yes. and in it was the secret, and he did not know. Hmm. Fancy that, Henry. What happened finally? Oh, my grandfather became an old man and died. Huh? There was so little left, and my own father was poor. One by one, he had to sell his family treasures, and at last, he had to part with the jewel case. With the map still in it. Oh, see, the great man. And then one day my father pressed by accident a wooden panel in the wall and it opened and... The wooden panel opened. Uh, maybe. And there was the letter from my great-grandfather telling about the treasure and the map. But of course by then it was too late. The jewel case was no more. Oh, of course, yes. For the rest of his life my father tried to trace it but without success. Mm. At, at last he died in poverty. Oh, no, 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 take it easy now. No, no, don't, don't take it so hard. <laughs> He was so good and so kind. Oh, I'm sure he was. And this jewel case has never turned up since? Oh, but that is the old point of the story, monsieur. It has. It has? Um, it's turned we, up? I saw it today. Where about? The flea market. You mean to say this jewel case is for sale in the flea market? Oui, monsieur. Well, then why didn't you buy it? Of course, you, you haven't got any money, have you? You're quite sure it's the same case. Oh, I would know it anywhere, monsieur. Besides, it is engraved on the lid, the initials of my great-grandfather, A.T. Ambrose Tournay. It is the same case. Oh, there can be no mistake. Uh, did you ask the price? Oh, the... no, no. I, I did not wish to seem curious for fear the man in the shop may become suspicious. Mm. But it is the same case. It, it, it should not be very dear. In the Rue Lafitte near where I live, there is an old man who lends money, and tomorrow morning I shall beg of him 5,000 francs, mm. and then I shall buy the case, and the fortune will be yes. mine. But suppose, uh, suppose he won't land it. Or suppose the case is more than oh. what you think it'll be. Oh, I shall find the money somewhere. Mademoiselle, you found it right now. Here, five thousand francs. Oh. There you are. Oh, but I couldn't do it. My... Oh, please. My hotel for George Sank. You oh. find me there anytime. Just ask for Harry Lyme. <laughs> Next morning, Henry L. and I spent a wildly exciting morning at Napoleon's tomb. And when we got back to the hotel around about lunchtime, there was Lisette waiting for us. She was looking pale and miserable. And she'd been very obviously crying. This morning, I went to the flea market yes. to buy the case. Oh, don't tell me it was gone. Oh, no, it is still there, but oh, Monsieur good. Laplage, he is the man who has it. Yes. Says it is a case of great antiquity and value. When I offered him 5,000 francs, he laughed. Well, how much does he want for it? Two million francs. Two million francs? What is this case? Solid gold and studded with diamonds? Oh, no, no, it is just a modest little piece. Mademoiselle, would you do us a favor? But of course. Would you dine with us this evening? Oh, oh no, no, you have been far too good already. Well, we want you to, don't we, Henry? Why, uh, sure. Yes, sure we do. It was great pleasure. Oh, well, if you put it like that. And besides, who knows? We can't promise anything, of course, can't we, Henry? But there's just a chance that we may be able to find some way out of this little difficulty of yours.
after Lizette had gone, I put the proposition to Henry L. Between us, we'd buy the jewel case, a million francs each. And then, when the fortune was recovered, we'd split 50-50 with Lizette. I can't say Henry L. took the idea first with what you describe exactly as wild enthusiasm, but then I hadn't expected he would. I don't know, Harry. I can't say it sounds very much like a guilt-edge proposition to oh, me. Oh, but surely, old man, if Lizette's story is correct... That's just the point. Is it correct? Well, I don't see any reason to doubt it, Henry. You're a good guy, Harry, and I like you a lot. But if you'll forgive me saying it, you're just a little naive. Now, hold trick. your horses, Henry. You know, I can't find some way to prove she's okay. To prove it. Will, will you come into it then? How do you figure on doing that? Well, leave that part to me. Just answer me one thing. Is it a deal or isn't it? Sure, Harry. It's a deal. <laughs> So far, our scheme was working 100%, and Henry L. was reacting exactly according to plan. After lunch, I left the hotel. Around about mid-afternoon, I returned with Paul in tow. He wore steel-rimmed glasses and a blue suit that was shiny with age, and his shirt cuffs were frayed at the edges. In fact, he looked precisely what he was supposed to look like, a minor government clerk. I introduced him to Henry L. Hank, I want you to meet Monsieur Berriot. Glad to know you. Bonjour, Monsieur. Uh, Monsieur Berriot's a clerk in the, uh, uh, just what's that again, uh, Monsieur Bureau Berriot? Internal Records and Personal Statistics. Uh, yes, yes, that's it. I, I've, uh, I've had Mr. Berriot making a few inquiries this afternoon. He's good enough to offer to come around to the hotel with certain documents and information he's able to obtain for me. Uh, maybe, Monsieur Berriot, you'll tell my friend, uh, what monsieur, you told me. Monsieur, a moment, Monsieur. Ah, good. The inquiry concerned the family of Tournay, of right. Ponce Bleu, in the right. department of saint edmond Correct, 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 correct yes. uh, Now, we begin with Ambrose Tournay. Paul had done a fine job, make it look good. I slipped him a 5,000 franc bill and off he went, bursting with gratitude. After he'd gone, I turned to Henry L. Well, Hank, you asked for proof. Now you've got it. You can't argue against all that evidence, can you? Don't misunderstand me, Harry. I didn't doubt Lizzie. Mm. I just wanted to be certain, well, that's all. Well, you're satisfied. She's okay, aren't you? Do we go ahead, Henry? Sure, a deal's a deal. We'll fix up the details with Lizette this evening and first thing tomorrow, we'll go and buy that jewel case. Check, check. <laughs> In a moment, Orson Welles returns as Harry Lyme, the third man. Now, Orson Welles, as Harry Lyme, the third man, continues in today's story, Vive la Chance. That same evening, we put the proposition to Lizette. Henry L. and I were to find the money to buy the jewel case. When the map had been found and her great-grandfather's treasure recovered, we were to split the proceeds half to us and half to her. Lizette was overcome with emotion and the tears of gratitude she wept were genuine, even if nothing else about her was. My admiration for Lizette as an actress soared about 100%, especially when she came to what was in fact the crux of our prearranged plan. Your generosity touches me deeply, monsieur, and I shall always be grateful, but I am afraid I cannot accept. Oh, why not, for Pete's sake? It is not fair. It is asking too much. Oh, nonsense. I have not, perhaps, made it sufficiently clear just how great a gamble this is. Eight years is a long time. Oh, I know, And in that time, the jewel case has probably had many owners. Sure, like Lizette says, it's a gamble. But what the heck? You know the old saying back in the States, Harry, if you don't speculate, you won't accumulate. Mm. Uh, then you think we ought to take a chance, Henry? Why, certainly. <laughs> And so, next morning, the flea market. As arranged, Lisette stayed in the cab. Following her directions, we had no difficulty in finding Monsieur Laplage's stall. 
if the flowers looked oddly like my old friend Pierre, who was Henry L. to know. And how was he to notice the quick wink that Pierre and I exchanged? In case we're standing up a show, among a lot of other gentlemen. Henry L. I tended not to notice it at first, and then after a while, he picked it up in a, an elaborately casual sort of way. What do you think of this old jewel case, Harry? Mm, you're quite attractive in its way, I guess, Henry. Maybe. I've got a sort of idea Millie might like it for a dressing table. Yeah. I'll give you 5,000 francs for it, monsieur. Please. You, you make the joke? Yes. Okay, 6,000. I'm not a guy to haggle. Um, monsieur, I have spent my lifetime among articles of antiquity. You look at it. I am an expert, an authority. Many famous collectors have wished to buy that jewel case. They have offered much money for it. Then why haven't you sold it? Because they cannot pay the price I am obliged oh, to ask. Everybody they it. cannot pay three million francs. Three million francs for a bit of junk like this? You must be crazy. I'll give you a million. Two and a half million. One and a half. Two and a quarter. One and three quarters. Ah, uh, you are a hard man, monsieur. Two million. Okay, sold. Uh, now. Take it easy, old man. Don't be too impetuous. But if I want a thing, I want it, and I'm prepared to pay. Well, so your money, two million Harry. francs it is. Well, the only trouble is I don't have that much cash on me right now. Well, I have half of it here if you can make up the rest. That's mighty kind of you, Harry. Let me see now. Yeah. yeah. Here we are. It was there, all right. A million francs in crisp new notes. A four-way split between Paul Pierre, Lisette, and myself. Lisette was still waiting for us in the cab. She grabbed the case eagerly. In a moment now, we should know. One of his rosebuds on this side is a spring that releases the false bottle. Well, try it. Come on. No, no. Try the other one. Oh, oh, there. Look, monsieur. You're right, right Lizette. Lizette. See? Look. Oh, there's a sheet of paper. Oh, it's a paper. It must be a map. Open, oh, open it up and I'm read so it, Lizette. I'm so excited. My fingers are hard. <laughs> I'm kind of excited myself. Oh, uh, there it is. Oh, it is. It is the map. This is terrific. <laughs> Let's take a look. For Pete's sake, it's all in French. Well, of oh, course it's in French. What oh, do you that's think? right. Of course it is. Can you read it, Lizette? Oh, but, but, but yes, it is very simple. What's it say? Now, well, tell us what uh, it says. Stand facing north yeah. at the northeast corner north of the, the outer north wall. Corner. Outer wall of what? The outer, outer wall, wall of my great-grandfather's property at Fontainebleau, I suppose. Oh, sure, that is. Yeah, at go on, Lizette. At a distance Lizette. of 55 paces, hey, there is a chestnut tree. A chestnut. I sure hope it's still at there. two meters north of the tree, D. Go on. Well, that is all. Except for the initials A.T., my great grandfather. Oh, that's initials. good enough for me. Come on, let's go. Well, I dare say you can guess the rest. Lizette led us to the old family mansion. We followed the directions. We located the chestnut tree, and we dug. After ten minutes or so, we struck something solid. It was a large metal chest. We got to the surface. And with trembling fingers, Henry L. smashed the rusted lock and we swung back the lid. Well, I'll be doggone. Oh, oh, oh no, it, it can't be. It's yeah, empty, all oh, right. Well, not quite. What do you make of this, Lizette? Oh, to me, it looks like a brass button of this sock that soldiers wear on their That's cutie. right, that's exactly what it is. Oh, there is on it a crest, a double eagle. You realize what that means, don't you? Oh, no. That means some Prussian soldier must have beaten us to it some oh, 80 oh, years ago. I can't believe oh, it. Oh, there's the evidence, oh, old man. Oh, this is terrible. I... I must say Henry took it well. No silly nonsense, no recriminations. And above all, not the slightest suspicion, as far as I could see anyway, that he'd been gypped. After dinner that evening, he suggested we might console ourselves for the loss of our dough with a champagne supper at Carol's. I pleaded a headache and let him go off alone. After he'd gone, I walked around to Pierre's hotel, knocked on his door. There was no answer. I knocked again, a little louder. Still no answer. A horrible, incredible suspicion crossed my mind. No, it couldn't be. It, well, it just couldn't. I went downstairs to the reception clerk. I, I asked for Pierre. Are you good, monsieur? He is no longer with us. He's left? Oui, monsieur. You don't know where he's gone, do you? I wish I did, monsieur. He still owes us for two weeks' rent. Is that all? You're lucky. He owes me a quarter of a million francs. The suspicion had become a virtual certainty now. I hurried back to my own hotel. For once, the luck was with me. As I was about to enter, I saw a familiar figure coming out. I slid out of sight towards it passed, and then I followed. In a few minutes, I found myself. Yes, you guessed it. 
in the Rue Lafitte. A hundred yards or so off the Boulevard Haussmann, my quarry turned in at a doorway. I was right behind him. It was a small private hotel. I followed him up three flights of stairs. He stopped outside a door. He knocked. It opened. He went in. I checked to make sure I had my gun, and I turned the knob and flung the door open. They were all there. Henry L., Paul, Pierre, and Lisette looking very smug and pleased with themselves. Henry L. lolling back in an easy chair, puffing a cigar and holding forth to the others. <laughs> and of course, the thing that tickles me, Pink, is putting it across a guy who's supposed to be as shrewd as Harry Lyle. That's all. Oh, that's all. Save it. Save it. Shut up, all of you, and keep your hands up. And in the open, too. Now, this little thing in my hand might go off. How dare you? How dare you try to pull a corny old trick like this on me, on Harry Lyme? You didn't kid yourself for a minute that I was really falling for it, did you? Well, I, uh, Harry, I, I, we... Honestly, Hank, I'm ashamed of you. And to talk to you, you seem such a sensible, intelligent sort of a fellow. Of course, monsieur, you will understand that we were never in any... Well, no, 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 it was what you call a practical joke. Yeah, practical joke. Right? Uh, no harm, man, Harry. Too bad you had to bust in like this and spoil the whole thing. Yeah, it's too bad. No sense of humor. That's my trouble. However, as I am here, you may as well let me have it back now. Oh, sure, Harry, sure. Hand it over, Paul. Uh, there you are, monsieur. Thanks. Now, I'll have the rest, if you don't mind. Uh, the rest? Oh, but it is all there. A million francs. There was another million, I seem to recall. But that was my money. Was, Henry, is the operative word. You mean? I mean, I want it. And now... But Harry! This is infamous, monsieur. You cannot do such I a thing. I am doing it. One million francs, please. Okay. Take it. Thank you. And from you, Lisette? I know. The 5,000 francs you so kindly lent the poor, starving little girl. No, no, not at all. From you, Lisette, one kiss. <laughs> you are so gallant, monsieur. Mm -hmm. If only instead of these useless imbeciles I had used my partner, ah. there is no telling to what heights we would attain. Ah, you flatter me. You flatter me, mademoiselle. Oh, not at all. I know a clever man when I meet one. You're so right. I repay my debt. Thank you, Lizette. Perhaps someday, who knows? Who knows? Hey, maintenant? Au revoir. Au revoir, mes amis. Merci mille fois de votre hospitalité. So long now. It was a good exit, huh? Flattered myself. Pretty good exit. Only one thing marred it. As I closed the door, a man stepped out of the shadows. Now, a cop is a cop in any language. There's no mistaking this one. For one wild second, I was tempted to plant one on his jaw and run for it, but discretion got the better part of valor. And when he spoke, I was glad. You are quite all right, Monsieur Lyme? Well, uh, sure. You have recovered your money. Well, please, Monsieur, you can be frank. I know everything. You do? But certainly. I have had our friends in there under observation for many days now. When I realized they were imposing upon you the old story of the jewel case, huh? I thought at first I would intervene and warn you. Then I said to myself, but that is ridiculous. A smart man like Monsieur Lyme would never let himself be caught by such an obvious trick. Uh, yeah. So I decided to wait and watch and let the comedy play itself out. <laughs> I was right, you see. And there is an old saying from the English. He laughs best who laughs last. That's the way it You goes, must have yes. found it very amusing, Monsieur. Oh, sure. I you say you have man. your money? Oh, yes, yes. I, I persuaded them to return it. And then all is well. All is well. I smiled to myself as I thought of Henry L. Wotherspoon's million francs reposing in my pocket. All was well. Very, very well indeed. And it wasn't until I got back to my hotel room that I realized the truth. How was I to know that when Lisette kissed me, she also picked my pocket? Harry Lyme returns in just a moment.
And now, Harry Lyme. I always say, honesty is the best policy. That's what I always say. Don't necessarily mean it. You take gambling, for instance. As W.C. Fields used to put it, you can't cheat an honest man. Which probably accounts for the trouble I have with cheats. Still, it doesn't stop me from gambling or dishonesty. For when in Rome, do the Romans or they'll do you. And when in France, <laughs> say, as the French always say, vive la chance. It's fun now. 